So everyone, my name is Nwa Maka Agbo, and I have the pleasure of being a board member with the Schumacher Center for New Economics. Um, I want to start off by thanking Winona LaDuke for opening um, earlier today. And for those of you that were fortunate enough to still be in the room, we actually had um, some young activists um, that gifted us a song uh, for water protectors. Are, are any of them still in the room? Could you raise your hand? Just wanted to acknowledge and thank you. They left? Oh, well. Well, thank you for the gift of song. Um, so I'm really excited um, to be able to invite some people, some old friends, um, and hopefully some new friends to a conversation so that we can continue to discuss land and liberation and what that looks like. I think it's important for us to first spend some time providing recognition to the indigenous people that took care of this land and stewarded it for us. Um, Sachem Hawkstorm reminded me that the Mohican people um, were displaced from this land as part, of the, as part of the Indian Removal Act. And so if we could just kind of take a moment to recognize and honor the people um, that have held onto this land, or stewarded this land for us. Thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to provide um, some opening comments to set context for the conversation that we're about to have. I don't think that it's an accident um, that we're here today to have a conversation about land and liberation and what it means for black and indigenous communities across the United States and around the world. We have been witness to fires in Northern California, repeated hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, floods throughout the global south, and so much more. And there's a way in which many of us are just starting to understand the urgency of the climate disruption and economic crisis that we're in. But I would offer that there are many others throughout the world who have felt this urgency and crisis for a long time. Whether it's undocumented people really working to make a dignified life for themselves in this country, whether it's the people of Madagascar that are now dealing with the bubonic plague outbreak in 2017. Many people around the world are suffering the consequences of what it means to live in an extractive, exploitative, and polluting economic system. And so not only do we have the opportunity to sit here together, but we have the privilege to be in this theater and have this conversation and we have the moral responsibility and the humanitarian duty to not only learn from, but recognize the work that so many communities of color and vulnerable communities are doing to not only articulate the vision for the world that they wanna live into, but are actually doing the hard and rigorous work of what it takes to get us there. And we have a responsibility to listen and to learn from them. Um, in prepping for the talk today, I decided to crack open my graduate study um, economics book. I didn't actually read it much when I was in school, but, um, but I paid good money for it, so decided it was going to be of some use today. And just wanted to share with you the opening introductory paragraph um, in the textbook. A society must find some way to decide what jobs will be done and who will do them. Once society has allocated people to various jobs, it must also allocate the output of goods and services they produce. It must decide who will eat caviar and who will eat potatoes. It must decide who will drive a Ferrari and who will take the bus. The management of society's resources is important because resources are scarce. I'll say that last sentence again. The management of society's resources are important because resources are scarce. And so this is how we are training our young people to look at the world, to look at a world in which the decision is between Ferraris and the bus, between caviar and potatoes. Winona provided us with a lot of different worldviews um, that are guiding the way in which people are interacting right now. I would offer that scarcity is another worldview. Scarcity informs how we think about not only our interaction with the planet, 
but our interaction with one another. Scarcity is grounded in the notion that there's just simply not enough. Not enough for you and for me. And so therefore, I must do my best to get what I can, even if it means that it comes at your expense. And the scarcity is not just about resources. The scarcity also speaks to the fact that we are not enough. It is telling us that as we stand as individuals, we are not whole on our own. And so this is a place where the climate crisis and the economic crisis actually speak to a human spiritual crisis that we're also tasked with addressing right now. And so if we understand that the worldview of our country is one that's based on scarcity, it explains why we could extract labor, resources, and wealth from people in the planet, why we could exclude certain communities from participating in the gifts and the benefits of, the, of what the world has to offer, why we may feel that it's justified to accumulate and hoard while others suffer, and how this all leads to the notion that those that are able to consolidate and control more and more power deserve to do so just by the very virtue of their ability of being the ones that were here first. The history of our country is one in which land and people are inextricably linked. We can look at the genocide of indigenous people from the east to west coast. We could look at western countries conspiring to create the post at the transatlantic slave trade and create a form of chattel slavery, Chinese Americans building the transcontinental railway, the list goes on and on. And I share all these pieces to create a context and understanding that our liberation is inextricably linked with the liberation of the land. And I would hope that um, all of us in this room, if, if not all of us in the ro this room agree with that sentence, I, this next sentence, I'm gonna have some feelings about it. But I would hope that all of us in the room are in a place where we understand that the ownership and slavery of a human being is immoral and wrong. And what we're tasked with in this moment is understanding, can we get to a place where we understand that the ownership and control of the land is just as wrong? Oh, I wasn't expecting a clap. And I also want to lift up, as a homeowner, this contradiction is not lost on me. I recognize that I have the privilege to even be able to make that statement for many of those that can't say the same for themselves. So we're in a moment where many people are lear learning to tap into their traditions, their cultures. Many people are seeking to learn from other indigenous communities about what does it actually take for us to transition into a new way forward based in regeneration, resilience, and restoration. If we can get to a place where we understand that first we must restore and regenerate the soul and the land, then we get to heal the planet. And when we heal the planet, we actually get to heal ourselves and each other. And that is part of the task that's before us. And so the Schumacher Center reached out to me. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a board member, and thanks to all the other board members that are in the room, um, and said, if you were going to have this conversation, who are the people that you would invite? Who would you reach out to? And so I thought about it. And I was like, well, if I was having a dinner party at my house, um, I would spend some time and call up some of my friends. And so I get to invite some of them to have this conversation with me today. So I want to pivot and introduce our amazing panel. Let me find my cheat sheet. Um, so I'll, first I'll start um, at the end with Gopal Dayaneni. And Gopal's um, visiting us out from Oakland, California, um, a longtime mentor and friend. Um, early in 2009, I had the opportunity to go to the Movement Generation and Ecology Collective's retreat. Um, and it was one of the first times I really, truly learned about what was at stake with the climate change crisis and how it was linked with the economic crisis. Um, we're fortunate enough to have um, Gopal with us in Great Parrington this weekend um, while he has his wife, Martha, um, his daughter, Aoife, and his son, uh, Kabi, Kubi? Kabi. Kabi, um, back home. Um, 
Gopal is also affiliated with organizations. He works as an ally for the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and he also supports um, the working world as a board member and the Center for Story-Based Strategy. Um, next, I'm gonna pivot to my girl, Carissa, also out of Oakland, California, born and raised. Um, Chris is one of the people that when, um, when something happens in the world, I kind of look to how is Carissa talking about it in this moment. It's usually on her social media page. I like to stalk her on Facebook. Um, but Carissa um, is respected so much um, in a number of different uh, black organizing communities for her leadership role as the executive director for Center for Third World Organizing. Um, Carissa has also been a longtime organizer um, and continues to train activists um, throughout, um, throughout the United States. She's also a member of Blackout Collective um, and Black Lives Matter in Oakland, California. Um, and at this dinner party, um, I would also deeply ask Carissa to bring her partner, Regan, um, and her daughter, Kyla, um, who are also amazing individuals. Um, and then my newest friend at this dinner party um, would be Sachem uh, Hawkstorm. I just had the opportunity to meet um, Sachem's family, um, Celia and Taryn and Amelia. Oh, I'm glad I took my notes. So thank you for being here. Um, Sachem Hawkstorm is a person that actually gets to help us understand the indigenous wisdom of this land that we're here in today. Um, as someone who's currently working to build a cultural art center in his community, um, as a space to not only provide skills and tools um, to his friends and neighbors, um, but also as a place to be able to provide housing um, to his community. So thank you all so much for being a part of the conversation today. Um, I wanted to open up by giving you guys all an opportunity to respond to the first question. Um, and the first question is, what does the concept of land reform mean to you? And how do you approach land reform in the work that we, you do? Okay, so for me, um, I'm Scattercoke. Uh, Indian, our people have been here forever. Um, as a matter of fact, I had an opportunity to have my hands in a 1,200-year-old fire uh, yesterday. And uh, I go around finding platforms um, for our wigwams and our villages and stuff like that. But we also have the oldest reservation in the country. Our reservation was established in 1736. And I'm renting an apartment in Wasaic, which is literally, I don't know, like four miles away from the reservation. Um, this is because our land has been taken from us by one of the most prestigious high schools, Kent School. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. And an electric plant on the south side. And um, Macedonia State Park, which people aren't living on, but for some reason we're not allowed to have. Um, so land, uh, you know, not having any land to grow our food anymore or, you know, have our history and have um, our houses. We can't, we can't have houses on, on what's left of the reservation, which is 400 acres of rock, we can't dig wells, we can't dig septic, we can't grow food. Um, it's not a safe environment for us to live, we can't work, um, and the surrounding towns don't want us there. So for me, it's like taking away every part of who we are by removing us from, from our land and our territory. And, you know, um, so, so what I'm trying to do is actually um, take back some land um, in whatever way I can to form a cultural center and bring our people back together and be able to uh, reteach ourselves who we are and our language and our culture. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. Cool. 
Um, so black folks have a very unique relationship to land um, that they, dates back to when folks were categorized and connected to land. Um, so at that point, folks were categorized based on the land mass that they were associated with. Uh, so the Mongoloids were associated with the region of Mongolia, the Caucasoids um, were associated with the Caucasus Mountains, and we were labeled Negroids and disconnected from a land mass. I um, mean, that has historically um, traced us um, and have worked land and bled on land um, and have a unique relationship, relationship to this land. Um, and it's, it's been a struggle because um, for me, I understand that um, land is not something that I can own but need to steward, and I recognize the power that land has in this country um, and the way the land has been used to decimate communities, um, displace communities. Um, so when we're talking about land reform, we're really talking about how are we in right relationship with the land um, and what is the process to um, reimagine our connection and to create a rebirth for us and our land. Can you stop there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Gopal. Um, thank you for having, having us. Um, uh, what does land reform mean to me? Uh, um, so it, I, I'm going to start with an uh, underlying premise, which is that um, the opposite of freedom is property, and that um, slavery is a sadistic and heinous form of property that infringes upon every possible freedom and leaves with the title holder a corrupted soul that is so toxic it must be passed down for generations, but that all property infringes upon freedom. And therefore, my assumptions about land reform begin with the recognition that what you do to the people, you do to the land, and what you do to the land, you do to the people. And those two things are so intimately related. So I refuse to draw a distinction between the microbial life in the soil and, um, and those whose hands are in relationship to it. Um, so that's where, that's where I'm going to start. Um, and then when I think about land reform in the sort of social movement context in which I operate and work, I think of there's sort of three dimensions of land reform. Um, there's how land is used, whether we're going to put up a Walmart or an urban farm, um, whether um, we're going to continue to pursue destructive development or whether we're going to use land to serve communities. Um, there's how land is, um, is held, so is it going to be held, and this is the sort of traditional approach to land reform from movements in the global south. Is it gonna be concentrated in the hands of a few or lots of different people going to be able to own land, the sort of redistribution of land notion. Um, so is it, is it held by a few or is it held by many? Um, and then the third is how is land governed? Is it governed as property or is it governed as commons? Is it governed um, in ways that allow us to be in right relationship to it for generations or is it going to be governed in a way that, um, it, that wealth is extracted from it? And, um, and I think all three of those things matter and I would argue that the revolutionary sweet spot is when we put all three of those things together and we think carefully about how we use land how it, how it, it becomes um, decentralized and democratized and, uh, and that its use actually directly meets the needs of communities um, uh, who depend on it. So I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna come back to Carissa because you kind of gave us a teaser with your first comment. <laughs> So uh, I, want, I want to get a little bit more from you. Um, so one of the groups that you're affiliated with is Black Land and Liberation. Um, and on Juneteenth of this year, your organization participated in a national direct action. Um, I was hoping you could spend some time telling us about that direct action and what were the goals and what were the successes. Yes, I did with Gopal. Gopal's my homie. Also, he's the shit. Can I cuss in here? <laughs> I can cuss in here. Great. Um, so, so we were at Gopal's house and we were dreaming up um, 
uh, resilient action. So, so I'm a member of the Blackout Collective and we have identified that specifically black folks take direct action using four frames either through a resilience frame where we're actually creating what we deserve and need, um, through a rapid response frame where immediately re uh, responding to some kind of uh, trauma, um, through reform where the direct action is in the process of winning a policy or a campaign, or through rebellion where we fuck it up because it's a Tuesday. Um, and so uh, we were, we have been um, over the last couple of years really in the process of rapid response, um, responding to all of the trauma and all of the um, uh, non-justice that, that folks were receiving around the police murders. Um, and so we wanted to be in a more visionary space and MG is definitely the organization that's always thinking about what is that movement strategy and not just campaign strategy. Um, and so we got together and started to talk about what it would look like for us to take action around land. Um, and so we had this idea to take um, 40 acres symbolically, um, that black folks could take 40 acres symbolically. Um, and so we started as just like this idea of a day of action, which ballooned in uh, into a year and a half project to really give black organizers and activists and some land workers a new frame around just transition and around land and direct action, and then to invite folks into taking and participating in a direct action on Juneteenth of this year. Um, and so we have folks take land across the country. Um, and it varied, so some folks uh, took a vacant house, some folks took a empty lot and put a, um, a play structure in there for young folks in that community. I supported the team in Atlanta, um, and it was, it was an interesting process. So the team in Atlanta um, decided that they wanted to take a HBCU, um, a HBCU that had been sold to the city for development, um, and a HBCU that had a historic presence in the community and was no longer accessible to the community. Um, and so folks, folks took um, a part of that property. Um, and as the folks who were coordinating the action, um, you know, we were like, all right, are we ready to put pictures up? Like y'all are in there, you have your security team, like let's visibilize this action. Um, and they were like, no, no, this is a maroon space tonight. This is a safe space where we're not gonna worry about police coming. We're not gonna worry about um, the confrontation um, of reclaiming capital. We're actually just gonna be in resilience and we're just gonna feed each other and we're gonna sing. Um, and it was a really, really beautiful night um, that I got to bear witness to that, that um, also gave me space to think about how visible our action and our movement needs to be all of the time um, and allowed me to recenter. Um, so yeah, the Black, the Black Land and Liberation Initiative was a really, really amazing project. Um, and out of that project um, came a lot of opportunities as well. So uh, my organization at the Center for Third World Organizing has been thinking about what does it look like for us to um, really think intentionally around how black folks and indigenous folks are working together in movement space. Um, and really thinking about um, black and indigenous folks who work around food justice and how those folks don't typically utilize the full organizer's toolbox. And so we're developing a project called Seeding Resistance to help answer some of those questions. Um, and could I ask you just one more follow-up question? Um, could you spend a couple of sentences speaking to the history of indigenous and black people in maroon societies? Yeah, so um, I don't, a few sentences, I need like a day. Um, so, so from the moment that the first um, slave ship that carried my ancestors touched this um, land, folks escaped. Um, and folks oftentimes escaped into the arms um, and communities of indigenous people. Um, and that um, history of maroon societies, quilombos, um, has existed for a really long time. Some spaces would only exist for months. Some spaces existed for generations um, in, in Central and South America. Um, and so we have a really beautiful history of um, being in a community together in spite of um, white supremacy, uh, colonization and imperialism. There was uh, a point in Southern, in, in, in um, South, 
South Carolina where uh, generals uh, required that indigenous folks do not be housed near black folks because of the concerns around insurrection. Um, and, and, and to be clear, our, our histories aren't um, all butterflies and, and candy. Um, we, we've had some challenges in our history. Um, and we are a mixed company, so we ain't gonna get into all that. <laughs> we keep it 100 in Oakland, that's what we say. Mm -hmm. um, so for the next part of the conversation, I want to pass it back um, to Hawk Storm. Um, so in 2011, you were a part of a group of people um, that lobbied uh, the UN, to the heads of state, to create um, a declaration for the rights of indigenous people. Um, I was wondering if you could spend some moments speaking to what this declaration signifies and what the experience was like in partnering with indigenous people from around the world to make that declaration. So, the the declaration was adopted in 2007, um, and I've been very, very fortunate to be able to work with so many amazing uh, indigenous leaders from all over the world uh, who made this happen and continue to work tirelessly on uh, human rights, basically. I mean, we, they are uh, the indigenous rights, but they are human rights. We're talking about land security and sovereignty, and and self-determination and all these things that, that you know, um, what we're talking about with land, if, if we're not understanding that the land is not separate from us and, and um, then we can't even move forward with what we're talking about in this conversation. Um, it, it, it took them 25 years to get to 2007 to get this into just a document that was adopted and still there is no mechanism for enforcement. Um, you know, we had people in 2016 go out to Paris and try to make sure that this document was mentioned in the Paris Agreement, and um, which really wasn't, which shows that they, we still don't have any security with this. Um, but we're still fighting, right? We still have to, you know, if we're not there and we're not in it and we're not putting it out there, then then they're just going to walk all over us like like the the colonizers always have. Um, so anyway, what it means to me um, is also just this sense of allowing us to really f know that we're important and that we are still here and and to be self-determinate and stop asking permission from foreign entities um, to tell us that we are still here and that, um, and to vindicate us. You know, we are, you know, one, one of the interesting thing is, like I, I work with the Sami and the Maori and the Mas, in the, so the Maori just had like their river <coughs> uh, claimed as a living, breathing entity which is huge, you know, that's never been done before. And they did it through a treaty that they have with England, right? And so they, the thing that is amazing about them is, you know, they've only been colonized for like 200 years, right? So they were able to keep their language. And that's part of with, with the United Nations Declaration of Rights and Indigenous People is allowing us to have our culture and our language and, and really reform that and bring it back. And it's not just about language. Our language is, is land-based. Our language teaches us about our land, teaches us about our culture. It's not full of nouns, um, like the controlling language of English. Um, it's our teacher, it's, it, it is who we are. It brings us our ceremony and our culture. But the interesting thing about the Maori is that they haven't changed the way that they talk. So when they say, they're not saying that water is life. They're saying that I am the water and the water is me. I am the land and the land is me. Now if you go back and just look at the names of our tribes, for instance, um, Mahican which is the natives from right here. I'm actually very Mohican. Um, that literally means river Indian. 
That's, that's the meaning of the word. So scattercoat means the mingling of waters or the people coming together, but we are water coming together. So that's, that's a language that we're not thinking about when we say, even, even when we say Earth Mother, we're, we're talking like it's separate from us, right? So we used to say, Hapkinnigak, Hapkinnigak. When you say Hapkinnigak, you're saying, this is my mother, and I'm part of this, right? But then, even in our language, it started to change um, after colonization, and you say Akinnigak, and it just means that that's the Earth Mother, but it's so separate from who we are. You know, so it's, it's about our language and, and understanding that we're not separate from from the planet, that, that the planet's part of our family and living and breathing. And so to have this UN declaration and to have the understanding of, of bringing our culture back and, and land security and, and like I said, like I can't go, I can't go to even to California and tell you how to take care of the land over there. I can tell you how to take care of it over here because this is what my people have been part of for a hundred thousand years. And I can go to a, a hike, a short hike in the woods and find 20 platforms of where my people lived for thousands of years. And I can touch the soil and dig in the soil and find a, a fire that kept my people warm. And that's biocultural diversity and that's what's talked about in the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples as well. So I think it's very important and empowering for our own people to have this declaration and to know that when everywhere in the world is having the same problem and you can come together at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and realize that, you know, it's not all the tiny individual problems that can amount to like thousands and thousands of issues, right? It's the 10 main issues that everybody's dealing with across the world and realize that we're not alone and that we can use this to, you know, really come together in unity and as one. So, you know, I have to ask a follow-up. Um, so since you spend some time talking to us about the importance of language, I was wondering if you could share a bit more about the cultural center um, that you're working on for your community. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's a, it's a project, and what we're trying to do is um, be able to get our, our people and our children back into learning their language, learning their traditional culture, uh, learning how to make crafts again. You know, like I said earlier, uh, we do have the oldest reservation in the country, but our houses were all burned down in the, in the 40s and 50s. We, we, like, we literally have three people living on the reservation and 3,000 members around it. Um, and that, you know, having this cultural center will not only provide like a land base um, that's safe for our people to come back to, um, but also a place where they can re-indigenize themselves and decolonize themselves and, and work together with the towns to, de you know, help all of us decolonize our minds because we're all extremely colonized. I don't care where you're from. Um, I don't care what re reservation you're from. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, we're talking about the, uh, the, the government system with with um, Winona LaDuke was, was bringing up, you know, the elected officials, even in our, in our um, you know, tribes. And that's a total foreign policy for us. That's totally adopting a foreign way of thinking and, and a colonized mind. We, we don't even realize how colonized we are ourselves. So we all have to do this together. I mean, this is something that is gonna take a lot of work and so, we want to build a cultural center that is a safe place to do that and that can educate and that we can bring educators in from all over the world to be able to you know teach and and work with us i mean like i said we're working in the un the sami have already offered um ways of providing you know structures to be able to have a government-to-government -government relationship 
um, with the foreign government and, and how they have formed a parliament amongst all their tribes to be able to do that. So that's something that we don't have here, but this is like having a cultural center and having an access point where people can come together and, and our people can come together and, and live and learn how to re-indigenize ourselves um, is so important. Thank you. Um, so my next question is for Gopal. I knew um, that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the Movement Generation Collective is known for its work on the Just Transition Framework. Um, and Just Transition is a term um, that's often thrown around, but very rarely defined. Um, could you spend some time actually telling us how Movement Generation defines Just Transition in this moment? Sure. Um, I'm going to wave a little booklet. Um, which um, has a lot, of, a, a lot of good, juicy information in it. It's called From Banks and Tanks to Cooperation and Caring. We just recently put it out, and you can get it at the Movement Generation website. Um, so now you can zone out, because everything I'm going to say is going to be written down. Um, just kidding. No, just, um, so uh, folks might be familiar with the term just transition. It really, in the United States at least, it emerged out of um, the relationship between um, organized labor and environmental justice folks in the late 80s and early 90s when, um, when some really forward-thinking folks like Tony Mazaki and others in organized labor had recognized that the work that they did and the jobs that they defended and protected were bad for the planet, bad for communities, and that they were on the front lines of, of, uh, of a lot of toxic industries. And so they got together with, um, with um, folks in, in, in the emerging environmental justice movement, um, emerging at least by name, um, and started to say, how can we work together to create mechanisms to transition workers and, and facilities from being dirty, destructive industries to things that we need? Um, and there had been some um, interesting work done. Um, folks might be familiar with the Lucas Aerospace story from, um, from uh, the UK in, the, in 1980, where, um, uh, where workers at Lucas Aerospace, they were going to shut down this aerospace factory and the workers. Um, it was wall-to-wall -wall unionized, so they created a, a worker combine and they completely reimagined what that factory, what that facility could do and proposed uh, social benefits and worker control and all kinds of amazing stuff. Um, and then, of course, they were attacked. Um, so this idea of what does it mean to transition these polluting industries is the origin of the, the sort of phrase just transition. Um, and given the moment that we're in, we are um, reimagining it to mean not just what does it mean to transition workers from a polluting facility to, you know, to a, a greener, cleaner job, quote unquote, but what does it mean to transition whole communities and what are we transitioning towards? And, um, and you know, transition is inevitable, justice is not. Um, and the nature of that transition and who leads it and how we um, reimagine the management of home um, is at the heart of our, our ideas around just transition and, and this vision. Um, and if I could take a second to say a little bit about some, this, strategically, it's also a framework around strategy. and. Um, and we work with communities all over North America and now internationally um, around building these kinds of strategies around just transition. And I think uh, a lot of what Winona talked about happening in, um, in her community is, is, is so deeply aligned. Um, but we basically, it comes down to four um, key strategies that have to work together. And they're all rooted in principles of ecology and living systems thinking. Um, and um, I'll just say them really quickly. Um, the first principle is what the hands do, the heart learns. Um, it is the principle that if all we do is fight against what we don't want, we will learn to love the fight and have nothing left for our vision but longing, and longing isn't good enough. That the first rule of ecological restoration is the restoration of our labor back into the web of life, and that we must actually live into the vision of the world that we, uh, that we need. Um, and um, we would argue that um, when we say labor and when we say work, we have a very expansive notion of what that means. Like, um, 
you know, first of all, we're not talking about jobs. Um, uh, where we would argue, we, all living things take energy from the sun, they convert it into power to do work. So we're not distinguishing between the beating of the heart and the building of a building and the hugging of a child and the singing of a song or the, uh, the saying of a prayer. Um, it's all work and all of it matters. Um, and much of it we can't even see how important it is to us um, in the moment. Um, and so that's, that's the first basic idea. I'm gonna not do them all, <laughs> I just realized. Um, but the idea that our, yeah, or shorten it. Um, the idea, the, the second principle is if it's the right thing to do, we have every right to do it. Come and on this, now, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's the right thing to do, we have every right to do it, which is the idea that the basis of revolution is not the struggle for power, the basis of revolution is rights. It's when a people are organized enough to exercise rights that they contest the legitimacy of existing authority. So when you put those two things together, you become both visionary and oppositional at the same time. And that's at the heart of what we're arguing for. And let's just be clear, rights are not given and rights are not taken away. Rights are inherent, they are exercised, and they are only ever violated. And that is the origin of violence. Um, and so, the idea, and you only have to actually write them down when they are threatened, otherwise it's customary, right? You only have to declare the right to breathe when it is being taken away from you. Otherwise it's customary, which is why indigenous peoples need rights now before life was just what it was. Um, the third principle is if we're not prepared to govern, we're not prepared to win. The daily practice of self-governance, from everything we do in our relationships to each other and how we build our social movement, how we govern our energy systems, how we create local currency, all of it is about the daily practice of self-governance. Um, because the state's supposed mandate to govern butts up against our inability to self-govern and they use that to shut us down. And the last principle is if it's not soulful, it's not strategic, that if we do not um, if we do not create a culture that speaks to our ancestries and our traditions, that uplifts our spirits and our souls, then um, we're, we're not gonna get where we need to be. It has to actually be beautiful and inviting. And, um, and you know, if you work really hard every day in your social movement work and then you go home and watch Game of Thrones, we're losing. Um, hey. Hey, yeah. hey. Mm -hmm. That was for Carissa. Ga Game of Thrones is a documentary about white people that is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned a lot about the strategies employed. And as, <laughs> as, I, as I am fond of saying, as I am fond of saying, transition is the process of navigating contradictions. So. I should. I should. I should. Sorry, that I, I, I went on too long, sorry. It's, it's all right, I, I'm a Game of Thrones fan over here too, so I, I'm right there with you. So. I'm, I'm a one percenter that's never washed it. Oh, I'm with you. It's okay. I'm it's it's you. okay. No, no, Navigating it's just a 70 hour commitment. Mm. <laughs> so Gopal, really quickly, can you remind us where we can all get that handy booklet? Oh yeah, yeah, you can, it's all here. It, um, you can go to the Movement Generation website. And of course, I, you know, I don't, I don't wanna speak at like, just the 30,000 foot level, like there's really, lots of folks are doing this everywhere. We're all doing it in our communities. I mean, the future arrives unevenly, like everything we need is here now. The question is how are we putting it together and how are we building power with it? Um, so before I pivot to our next set of questions, I want to remind folks, if you do have questions, please do start to pass those to the aisles um, and someone will come down um, and pick them up. Um, so I'm going to come back uh, to Sachem Hawk Storm. Um, so Winona shared a bit about the prophecy of the seventh fire. Um, and I'm curious, actually, this question is for all three of you, but we'll start um, on this end of the table. Um, which path do you think that we're on? Do you think that we're currently on the green path or the scorched path? So that's a very interesting question and very interestingly phrased. Um, because right now we're in the time of the seventh fire. Um, and I believe that we're not on the path yet. I believe that the choice is right out in front of us. I think that we can see exactly what's happening on around us, but we still have time to wake up and be on the green path. We can see 
what can happen. We can see the tar sands. We can see the black snake. We can see that scorched path. But we don't have to choose to walk on it. And right now, we all are united, like the way the prophecy says in the unity tribe, and bringing everybody together in the path of love, in the path of the green path, the path of love, the tribe of unity, when we are all one and we're mending the, the great wheel, then we don't have to choose the scorched path. Then, then we don't have to be on that path. But if we don't, if we, if we just come here, listen to this, and not pass this on to our neighbors when we leave here, it's very likely that we'll go down that other path. Because it's really easy to fall into. It's really easy to pass the baton to someone else and say that it's somebody else's problem. It's really easy to turn off our TVs or our minds to what we don't want to see. And unfortunately, like Winona said earlier, we don't have time for that anymore. Thank you for that reframe. Um, let me reframe the question for, uh, for Chris and Gopal going forward. Um, so there's an activity that Movement Generation does at its retreat, um, and it invites people to select where they would stand on a spectrum of options. And I guess I'm curious if, if the question were, um, if you had to stand on the spectrum of options of um, in this moment, um, would you say that we are starting to pivot towards the scorch path or pivot towards the green path? Where would you say you fall on that spectrum um, and why? Yeah, I, th I think this I think this question is super interesting. I definitely want to respect the prophecy and, without having a full understanding of it. Um, you know, there's never just utopia or or just dystopia, right? So right now, folks are living in a utop utopia, and right now, folks are living in dystopia. And so I would argue that for black folks, we've been living on a scorched path since we were brought to this country, um, and that. Um, I'm not confident that we have enough unity um, across difference to actually move on to a green path. Um, the ways in which anti-blackness shows up, um, the ways in which um, systems of oppression still negatively um, and disproportionately impact my communities. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that we are, um, we have enough unity um, or, or folks uh, see black folks' humanity enough to be able to um, step onto the green path and be thinking and bringing us with them. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Krissa. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this on the on the which path are we on? I, I um, again. I, I think it's a it it the the prophecy is really helpful for laying out. Um, for us in our imaginations, the world we want. But I, I also, I also feel like it's a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Miles Horton and the idea that we make the road by walking, um, and I actually think those two paths crisscross all the time, and that actually it isn't just about choosing a path, it's actually about, it's about restoring the path that we're on also, it's about remembering our way forward um, in some ways. Um, uh, I think, um, because I think it's, it's, almost, it's almost too easy to imagine that we can just choose a different path we're going to have to surf the collapse of the um, of of um, a death dependent economy, and we have to build um, the mechanisms and infrastructure and resources and resilience within our communities to navigate the the, the changes and the trend and that are that are inevitable um, in some ways. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I think it's a really powerful way of lifting up the moment that we're in. Um, and, you know, we are, in, in a sense, at, at a tipping point. Um, uh, and um, so I think in that way it's useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that you can think of it as, like, um, 
and I mean, it's almost, it's, for me, the scorch path is, it's really a paved road, you know? It's, um, it's, a, it's a well paved road. Um, and, um, and I would suggest that, like, um, in order to liberate our souls, um, we have to, um, in order to liberate our souls, we have to liberate the soil. And in order to liberate the soil, we have to liberate our souls. Like those two things are deeply related, right? Um, so we have, to, we have to rip up the literal concrete that paves over the soil. And, but to do that, we have to like take a sledgehammer to the con cognitive concrete that paves over our, our political imaginations. And to do that, you really do need to take a sledgehammer to the ground. Like you have to do those things in dynamic relationship to each other to get free. And, um, and so I kind of feel like I'm like, I'm ready to like, I'm ready to transform the scorched path because that's, that is, I'm not going to pretend that that's not the moment we're in. Yeah. Um, cause there's no, there's no walking away from it. There's, there's transforming it. Yeah. And, and I would add that, yes, yeah, snap, go Paul up. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I would add that we actually can't be in right relationship with the earth if we're not in right relationship right. with black folks and indigenous folks. Right. Because if, if folks believe that you can treat the earth right mm -hmm. while still treating black and indigenous folks the way that black folks and indigenous folks are treated, right. that it's, it's, it's just not possible. I think it's so funny that you brought the roads up because I was just thinking the other day um, how, you know, the Earth Mother is, is a living, breathing being, right? And I don't know if anybody's ever heard that if, like, you cover yourself in paint, you stop breathing. Like, you can pass out and, and actually not breathe. And so we have all these roads covering our Earth Mother and all these things that we're doing <laughs> covering her pores so she can't breathe. And then we're extracting her blood on top mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling how anybody could possibly think that that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we take a deep breath? Because they just said some things that we actually need to soak in. Thank you. I'm going to pivot back to Carissa. Um, and this question was not one that I shared with you earlier, but, um, but I think it's actually important um, to hear the personal stories behind the people on the stage. Um, and so Carissa um, actually lives, Carissa, did someone say hey? I missed something. It was a sneeze. Oh, sorry. Bless, Bless you. you. <laughs> um, uh, so Carissa used to live, um, or I used to live down the street from Carissa, um, and her family has created a beautiful urban garden. Um, and it's a place where they have invited activists um, and community groups um, in to be able to have a space, um, a sacred space to do their work. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your experience in being an urban farmer and creating an urban sanctuary with your family and neighbors. Yep, so I am a, I identify as a black radical farmer, um, but I'm black and indigenous. My mother is Haudenosaunee. Um, and so she had this vision to basically create a retreat, an urban retreat center. Um, and then posed a quote to us by Dr. Howard Thurman. Um, and the quote is, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Um, and so she said, what makes y'all come alive? Um, and at the time, um, <laughs> me and my husband said, weed, a cannabis really makes us come alive <laughs> or sometimes go to sleep. Um, it makes us hungry. It makes a lot of things happen in our lives that we really like. Um, and so she basically gave us uh, her garden plot. We were living in subsidized housing in Berkeley at the time um, and gave us her plot. And that's how we got into farming. Um, we started with like 20 plants that all got stolen. Um, 
And uh, our second batch uh, started getting eaten by bugs and we were really interested in thinking through our first crop we had done with pesticides, trying to make our buds look as pretty as possible and couldn't afford to continue to do that. So we started to try and figure out ways to um, make our, our, our plants healthy and happy without pesticides um, and stumbled on some indigenous practices around companion planting. Um, and so that is, it, it kind of ballooned actually Movement Generation created a documentary called Marijuana the Gateway Plant that documents um, a little bit of, of about our, our experience. Um, and so we decided that we didn't want a huge retreat center, um, but that we just wanted a space for folks could come and build strategies and love on each other and be in ceremony. Um, and so we built a, sw a sweat lodge um, uh, our roadie is Arapaho, so it's in the Arapaho tradition. Um, and uh, we received a ce cease and desist order from the city um, for praying. Um, and our neighbors, uh, super ironic, like our neighbor is like this black dude um, who on his consultant website talks about how he uses you know, seven generations and third paths, it's all this indigenous language, um, but tried to take us to, try to um, push the city to um, end our practices because he said that uh, wood smoke was a thousand times more carcinogenic than, than um, tobacco smoke. So we, we just spent the last um, two years battling the city of Oakland um, for our right to pray. Um, that is, um, you know, and so sometimes I struggle with the right framework, right? The mm -hmm. rights framework, and I think people who um, have had their rights violated so consistently oftentimes do. Um, but we luckily um, just won, and so we are allowed to um, have ceremony again. Um, and so we're... Uh, we're, we're rebuilding our fire pit, but you know, we, we move with the season. So our, our new sweat will be built in the spring with fresh willows. Um, I'm going to ask Paul and uh, Sachem Hopstorm one more question before I pivot to all the questions that are popping up on this iPad. Um, so I'm going to go to you, Gopal. Um, so I was just with you about a month ago now, um, or three weeks ago, um, at the Movement Generation Collective Retreat, and we were supposed to be at the Occidental Arts Ecology Center in Northern California. Um, and then the fires happened and devastated um, so many families um, in Northern California um, and the workers um, that tend uh, to that land. Um, I was wondering if you could spend some time speaking about um, how we look at land reform um, in the context of its rapidly changing climate um, and in the context of grows growing conservatism. So as we look at um, our current administration, um, as we look at uh, the UK preparing for Brexit um, and the young Austrian leader coming into power, what does land reform mean in this context? Wow. Okay. Um, just feel free to cut me off okay. at the point where I it's necessary. <laughs> I will. Um, so yeah, one thing I, I, I want to say is that you know we, we at Movement Generation we try really hard not to talk about things just in terms of climate. You know the climate frame, the climate disruption frame tends to um, have people look up and count carbon in the atmosphere as opposed to um, looking down at the economy, at the exploitation of, of and, and erosion of seed and soil and story, which is actually the existential crisis we face. Um, and um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the well, one thing is instability is the new normal. Like we, the reality is that peak oil, peak soil, peak water, peak everything, is. Um, is the material constraint on the economy. Like, people think of peak as this kind of like material thing of running out. It's actually energy returned on energy invested. It's an economic equation. And the peak is a moving target because, you know, obviously if you live in Appalachia, the, we blew up your mountain and destroyed your watershed for coal. Peak coal, peak coal happened a long time ago for you. Right? We occupy countries for oil. Peak oil happened a long time for those folks. If you're the CEO of Exxon, you know, there's all kinds of ways 
to, re to um, subsidize the energy in and increase the energy out if you're measuring both in terms of profit, uh, cost and profit, right? So, but we are up against a material constraint. So the latitude of the economy to navigate these changes is, is shrinking. Um, and that's why everything is subsidizing this extractivism and subsidizing this, um, the enclosure of wealth, because you, you have to gut public education, you have to reduce services, you have everything, everything has to subsidize this death-dependent economy, right? And that creates a high level of instability. So we were talking about this last night, and I'll just super quickly, like, we are transitioning from, people talk about late-stage capitalism, we're transitioning from, late stage neoliberal capitalism to a lawless libertarian capitalism head by evil, evil, nasty, white supremacist, anti-Semitic people like, <laughs> like Robert Mercer, you know? Um, and, um, and those, that ideology is, that's all coming coming to a head, and probably one of the best articulations of it is like the last three pages of Tanashi Coates's um, Between the World and Me, um, and, and just the, what that reality means. So I think there is this sort of opportunity and crisis moment, the, the question of just recovery. What does just recovery look like in Northern California where, we, where organizations are coming together to have to have um, a disaster collectivism response to the disaster capitalism that's coming. Um, and um, I know Winona brought up um, Puerto Rico and, um, and the fact that um, she mentioned that Elon Musk is talking about solarizing Puerto Rico. I actually think that's a form of disaster capitalism. I don't, it's, it's not really about clean energy. It's about who owns it, who controls it, whether it's democratic. Like those, the technology isn't the answer. The, the community control is the answer. And I just want to, I just want to, as a closing, thank you, as a closing note on that, um, if you want to know how to support the just recovery in Puerto Rico, which is being done by an alliance of Puerto Ricans and grassroots organizations in the United States, and, and Puerto Rico is a multiracial community of indigenous, um, uh, Latino or, or Spanish descendant and, and black descendant communities, um, the Climate Justice Alliance, which we're a part of, and Greenpeace um, have teamed up and we're sending resilience recovery on Greenpeace ships to Puerto Rico that are being like starts and seeds and um, clean energy infrastructure and organizers to um, Puerto Rico to support um, both organizing and a just recovery. That's the kind of opportunity that we have to reimagine um, our relationship to land and, and um, in this moment. And that's also happening in the North Bay and it's happening all over. So. Just wanted to. I just want to add two quick things. Um, so one, also the Virgin, the U.S. Virgin Islands also are um, devastated, um, and we don't hear about them because they're black, right? And that's the way that anti-blackness shows up even in disaster recovery. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say was just something I was inspired by. So I, I, I happened to be at a gathering with um, Brock. Um, who helps to run Occidental. Um, and so y'all couldn't be up there because of the smoke, but there were folks who were in those communities um, who were undocumented and who were scared around their ability to move freely. And so they actually opened up their center for undocumented folks to come up there. Um, and so folks, uh, I think he said there was like 60 to 70 mm -hmm. people. They were there for a whole week feeding folks. He said some folks stayed up there for two weeks, feeding folks, singing, make, just making sure that folks felt safe in the middle of that um, um, disaster. And so that, you know, Occidental is a super uber, uber white group, um, but that's what it looks like, folks putting their privilege on the line to support other communities. And so I really appreciated that it wasn't in like a charity-based model, because y'all know white savior shit is fucked up, so don't do that. But it was really beautiful. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm going to start pivoting towards um, some of the questions that are popping up um, over here. One of the things that um, moves me about all of you is that in the midst of doing this work, you're all parents, right? So you're helping to steward young people into a climate-changing world. And so one of the questions that came up is, 
What words do you have for your children during these times of ecological destruction and racial injustice? We'll start here. <laughs> wow. Um, wow. I think that to just always be conscious of your neighbor, always be conscious that we don't own the things that we have, we, we are borrowing them for the next seven generations. And if you always know that, then you can never destroy it because it's not yours to destroy. Like. Like what gives me the right to poison the water if it's not mine? and it's part of me and part of you. So if you, can, if you can think that way and realize that this is not ours, that we're a part of it, then you can pass it on to your great grandkids. I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, oftentimes I hear folks say, um, I do this so my children will have a better life. Um, and I don't think that's my reality. Um, I do this work so my 14-year-old, really badass, amazing daughter knows that she has to fight every single day of her life for what she believes in and what she needs. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I can tell a quick story. Um, at one of the first Movement Generation Justice and Ecology retreats, um, you know, uh, my initials are GD, and the joke is that it stands for gloom and doom, because I spent a lot of time, I spent, a, I spent a lot of time tracking the scale, pace, and implications of the crisis, as well as the false solutions around technology and lots of other things. Um, so people find me scary. And, um, <laughs> and someone asked at the retreat, it's like, why do you why do you all have kids like with what you know why did you have kids <laughs> and i was like well not having children is a terrible strategy for the survival of a species <laughs> like it just seems like a really bad strategy um but also you know um I also said something that I got in trouble for, which is I said, well, I think of them as like hand grenades. You raise them, raise them right, you chuck them as far as you can in the future and hope they go off. <laughs> and I got, I got in trouble for that too. Um, but um, actually, I think for me, um, I don't, it's not, it's not even about what we say, it's about how we live. Like, you, you don't teach values, you live them. And if you don't live the values you're articulating, the only thing you're teaching is hypocrisy. Mm. And, um, mm. come through. See, when Go Paul talks, sometimes you just gotta say, I shake, because it'd be like church up in here, right? <laughs> you're ridiculous. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, um, my, my kids, you know, they, they're, I live in an intentional community. Uh, my children, were, all the children were born into it and raised in it. And so when, when it's time to be in the street, we just, in the street, there's not, a, there's not a, like, I don't feel like going. That's just not who we are. We just are. And luckily, my kids kind of love direct action and are kind of addicted to it. Mm. Um, but the, the, the last thing uh, I just want to say is, I think they also are just so much more sophisticated in their understanding. I think I mentioned this to some folks the other day, but at one of our retreats, my daughter was nine years old, and um, she sat through a whole session on biological and cultural diversity and the web of life, and after it was done, I was like, so are there any questions or comments? And she raised her hand, she's nine years old, and, um, and she says, you know, it's not really a web, it's more of a tangle. And then everybody kind of giggles because she's a nine-year-old. And I was like, what? What's, explain what you mean. And she said, well, it's just so knotted up that it can never actually be unraveled. And, and her ability to embrace complexity mm -hmm. and to navigate complexity, like she hasn't, she hasn't been as deeply colonized by the machine metaphor. And, the, you know, she doesn't, she, she's... She, she can live in the complexity in a way that I think um, many of us um, don't. And so I take great um, excitement in that possibility that they're the future.
And so no pressure to the young people in the room, um, <laughs> but we're counting on you, very much so. Um, so the next question um, from the group is, you know, this work is, is for the long haul. And we have some victories and we have a lot of losses. Um, and we will, we are already losing a lot of people. We've lost people in Puerto Rico that are, continue to be, remain uncounted. Um, the landslides of Sierra Leone. And so given the depth of the challenge of this work and the grief that we're moving through, how do you stay balanced and calm through the trials and the work that you do? I'll start back up I think, here. Um, just knowing that we don't have a choice and knowing that um, if we're not doing it, who's gonna do it? You know, we don't, like we were talking about the seventh virus prophecy, we don't have any time to wait for somebody else to do it for us. And, you know, if it's the right thing to do for our children, then let's do it. I mean, I can't think about, I can't think about just powering my house today. I can, I can think about powering my children's house in the future. You know, it has to be sustainable. Food has to be sustainable. Energy has to be sustainable. Yeah, we're not gonna go back to all living in wigwams and teepees. Um, but we can do it in a clean way and we can do it where we're not just focused on what we can get today. You know, so I think that, that um, I don't have a choice in doing what I'm doing. So, I mean, if, I'm gonna, if we're going to be chaotic about it, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And, you know, yeah, all this bad stuff's happening around us, but it's been happening. You know, and, and um, you know, I mean, I come from a reservation of drugs, alcohol, rape, murder. I mean, that's, it, it's just that's what our culture is and that's what we've been dealing with so how do we break away from that it's kind of like what put, put, put me on my my mission is getting away from that and not wanting the same thing for my for my children you know i don't want my i don't want to be my dad you know um i think it's it's time that we stay focused and make it make a change for all of us um so for me, the, this work is resilience work. This, you know, I, I, I really struggle with when folks talk about self-care and needing to step away from movement to do self-care, because this is my self-care. Um, and I would argue that for a lot of folks, um, it is. Um, and I think what is challenging is the same thing that's challenging at your job. It's the interpersonal shit, it's the ego mm -hmm. shit, right? It's that, that is the same because of that's how, um, part of our system manifests itself and part of the ways that we respond to our trauma manifests, but the actual work of building relationships and getting to see my comrade, you know, upstate New York, uh, I didn't make it, but I'm trying to go see July. I'll make some, some damn um, 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 maple syrup. Um, but like that is, that is resilience, right? Um, being able to um, put my body in places so wheels don't turn, as Baird Rustin um, said. That to me is, is um, a practice that I'm trying to cultivate. Um, and it is what keeps me through, through the trauma. Um, and I tell folks all the time, but I wasn't born conscious. I know it seems like it, I get it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I wasn't born conscious. And I, like, I literally remember before I was conscious, life was funner. It was. When I didn't think about all of the millions of microaggressions I felt every single day, um, when I didn't understand that the, the, the system that in front of everybody says that they're here to protect me um, is creating the conditions that, uh, for my life to be um, dehumanized, um, that, that was funner. Um, and my life now is richer and fuller. Right, and so I've made that trade off, and I'm comfortable with that trade off um, because what I'm fighting for is worth it. Mm. Ashe. Ashe. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, th I think I have a, a similar orientation. Uh, you know, people talk about work-life balance a lot, and at Movement Generation, we talk about work-life integration. Um, so my kids, my family, my community—it's—it's it's all, it's all the, it's all the, we do it all together. And I think um, oftentimes the, so we 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 do. There is an urgency in in terms of the the scale and pace of the crisis we face. It has been urgent for a very long time, um, and um, and shit's been hard for folks for a very long time. But what we cannot uh, afford is to allow urgency to enable desperation and desperation to enable um, false solutions. We don't, we don't have the time to waste on, um, on false solutions. So the urgency has to motivate us to take concerted action towards the, towards the right, um, you know, take right action in the direction we need to move and to constantly be um, working in that way. Um, rather than indulging in the fantasy that there's going to be shortcuts or techno fixes or that, you know, like any of that. So that's, that's you know, for me, one piece of it. Um, and then um, the, um, the other, I guess, um, big part of it is that um, the, like, the, the community you build is the is the solution in and of itself. That's the whole principle of the daily practice of self-governance. It's like, you know, hard and bad are not the same thing. Like we have to be willing to do the work of building community and struggling together and doing all of that. That's the only way we're gonna get through this. And no matter how bad things have been on the planet, people have always celebrated birth and honored death and marked rites of passage and told stories and shared food and sang songs. And that that um, and if folks gave up, like if black folks gave up during slavery, think about how much worse off we were. Like our movement is built on a culture of resistance and resilience from from folks from slave rebellion to indigenous rebellion to migrant rebellions. Like that is what got us. That that's our power. So. Um, there's just not, like giving up is just uh, kind of not even in the cards for us. Can I just add that, um, like, I'm a direct descendant of Massasoit, Sassacus, Uncas, King Philip, Katona. Like, knowing what all of these relatives have gone through just to make sure that I'm here right now, make sure that my daughters are sitting here right now, is insane. And for me, to know this, have this knowledge of, of all these people that, that, all the way from the Thanksgiving Treaty, King Philip War, the Pequot Massacre, all of these things that have happened here, the fact that I'm on the East Coast and actually I'm here right now, tells me there's no way that I could, that I could just go to sleep on that. I mean, there's no way. Yeah. You know? Right. So um, I'm going to take facilitation privileges and jump here in the stack for one of the questions and, and give our panelists a second to catch their breath and rest. Um, so one of the questions is, how can we move beyond identity politics to achieve meaningful change? Um, and I wanted to take a moment to address this question um, because for me, it's, personal, it's personally important for people to be able to be able to identify themselves. Um, there has been a lot coming out um, on the larger national political scheme of wanting to move away from identity politics. And I would offer that when we move away from identity politics, we fail to recognize the specific ways different groups are oppressed. And different groups are oppressed in very different strategies. So that's why anti-blackness shows up as slavery, police brutality, redlining. That is why anti-Semitism has shown up um, in the form of the Holocaust. That is why anti-indigenous uh, anti being uh, the genocide of an indigenous people have shown up as removing them off of their land. And so this ask, to, this ask for people to move away from identity politics is asking them to not be able to name the specific ways that they are harmed. 
And if we're actually trying to move ourselves out of the challenges that are impacting us today, we have to be skilled and nuanced enough to have multiple strategies that allow us all to move forward into liberation, right? It's actually not gonna be um, one turnkey solution for all of us. And so can we be big enough to hold the complexities of all the ways all of us are impacted so that we all get to get to that just transition? Because when you're asking us to move away from identity politics, you're asking us to fall into the dominant, nar the dominant narrative, and the dominant narrative of, is white supremacy. Yeah. So this next question is specifically for Hawk Storm. Oh, sorry, did anybody want to add to that? Sorry. Of course I do, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? What she said. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, so for Hawkstorm, there's a question of how can land trusts best assist Native Americans? Wow. That's the question. Um, I have real mixed uh, feelings on that. Um, I understand why land trusts are established. Um, well, I guess uh, the original reason land trusts were established was to make it so that natives cannot sell the land and white people can't buy the land from natives. Um, from what I'm seeing now is that they want to reform the land trust on reservation lands so that, of course, they can get the minerals from all the reservations and kind of take advantage of the fact that a lot of natives are uneducated and poor and dealing with so much that they could go after the quick fix. Unfortunately, if that happened, that would be the end of Native Americans in this country and it would probably take a very short period of time um, because most of our rights are based off of our land. Um, and most of our, through the, through the federal system, not, not through our self-determination, right? But that's right now what we're kind of trapped in. Um, so if we don't have our land, we no longer have our identity and our, and, and our culture. So, Having, having uh, the land trust helps in that way. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and sorry. Um, so in Oakland, um, the tribe that is indigenous to that land is the Ohlone, um, and they don't have any land. Um, and so they just formed a land trust um, that doesn't have land in it, but their hope um, is that they'll acquire some land. Um, and actually through our, through the Black Land and Liberation mm -hmm. Initiative, the folks who were taking land in Oakland um, were hoping that they'd be able to hold the land and put pressure on the city, that the city would put that land into a land trust for the Ohlone people. It's called the Segorte Land Trust, if folks are interested. They also have a city tax um, that folks in the community can pay. Um, where you can pay a tax to the Ohlone for living on their land, which I think is super brilliant and because we should pay a motherfucking tax. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, right. I'm cussing too much. I'm going to cut it down. <laughs> I'm going to stop cussing. Yeah, I need to do that. So, Gopal, um, I've had the pleasure of seeing you show up as an ally in many direct actions. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the Bay Area. Um, and Krista did a great job of um, speaking to one of the specific examples um, why allies have shown up to support um, communities of color. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, what does it look like to be um, a good ally to indigenous people and people of color? <laughs> That's not funny. Um, it's a little side chatter here. Uh, well, um, let's see. Um, we're as a, as a as um, a South Asian um, and um, as a person of color in the United States, I certainly experience um, uh, oppression and discrimination in certain ways. I do not. I am never going to pretend that my experience is in any way um, 
comparable to the experience of black folks in America or indigenous peoples in America. And what, what the British did to, to India, the world has done to Africa and the diaspora a thousand times over. It is the perfection of the colonial um, logic and it is, and, and the path to total liber liberation travels through the liberation of black folks, it travels through the liberation of indigenous peoples, it is the restoration of people's right to make home in place um, that, we, that we have to fight for. So I, I just wanna be clear that like, what it means to be an ally is not just about what white people do, it's about what we all do um, for each other. I believe, I believe deeply that, um, that a key pillar to, to well, that we will know we are working our way out of this crisis when, when, um, when Palestine is free. That, mm -hmm. that there is no, there is no, like there is no path to a world in which we, um, in which um, we can live right, in right relationship with the land when, you know, in, in that context. So, that's, that's one piece of it for me. The, I think the first thing I would encourage people to do is, um, is um, we, an expression we use, find your front line. Like, understand your location in the system and the way in which um, you're, you are, um, you are, um, your humanity is eroded by it in the ways that your, um, your relationships are, are um, are uh, damaged by it. Um, and that's not because I think everybody should work on that, but to understand your relationship to the system deeply allows you to understand then the strategic point of intervention um, in, um, in transforming it. Like, I understand how I am um, oppressed by the system and I understand that, that the strategic point of intervention right now is going to be um, or one of the strategic point of interventions is black liberation, which is why, I, that's why we had Asians for black lives. That's why we throw down as hard as we can. And it's because we recognize the deep interconnected relationships and, and how the system is playing out is, is uneven. Um, so I think understanding that, finding your front line, understanding your location in the system and then figuring out how to build those authentic relationships. And then, a, you know, just, uh, be willing to be messy. Um, you know, we we make a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot, a lot of mistakes, um, and I always say to my kids, you know, we're all better than the worst things we say or do, and there's always a right thing to do next. Um, that's not a path, but that is a like figure out when you've made mistakes and figure out how to make amends. Um, and it's with that humility that we can actually end up developing meaningful relationships with each other. Um, yeah. um, so the next question I'll pitch to Carissa. Um, Carissa, what kind of strategies are successful when the wealthy do not want to surrender wealth, control, or land? Mm. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a direct action strategist, so I always suggest taking it. Take it. Um, I think that's first and foremost. Um, take, take it, take it quickly, take a lot of it. And take um, it back. And take it back. It was not theirs. Yes, yes, take it back, because it wasn't theirs. Um, but also, we, we, have a, uh, we have a fundamental problem in movement, um, and it is that we try to appeal um, to um, folks who are in positions of power, their humanity. So um, everybody has an imperative, um, including the systems that govern us. Um, and our imperatives as folks who work around and for social justice is a moral imperative, right? We do the work that we do because it is the right thing to do. Oh. Um, and um, the systems and the people who govern the systems, that is not the case. But we continue to engage them as if um, they have the same moral imperative that we do. And the reason why I know we do that is because we'll have a press conference where we'll put people up on stage and we'll say, treat these workers right or stop polluting our water. And if they cared about that, they would have not, they would have stopped a long time ago. So actually we need to be more strategic. Um, I'm a big fan of a Sun Tzu quote, um, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. 
Um, and so we need to be thinking about what are their cracks in their system? What are the imperatives? And what do they need? What, what do these systems need in order to function? And then how do we target and attack those things? And then we will win. <laughs> And before I give my, the last question to Hawkstorm, I want to make sure that Winona can join us on stage. So I'm going to ask, and then Winona will magically appear. Um, so the question is, um, in what ways uh, does our current educational system reinforce colonial ideas? How do we move forward in a positive way? <laughs> <laughs> you got an awesome question. Yeah, that's that huge. Awesome um, wow. Somebody in the audience asked that? Yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, okay, how do I start that? Um, I think that... Whew, colonial ideas, everything. Um, Everything in our educational system right now reinforces colonial ideas. I think that, you know, the first thing that you do when you, in school, is spread your allegiance to a flag. Um, there, this, I, <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> I think. Okay, you get to take a deep breath, take yeah. it in. You get to take a second. Okay. Because it's a question we should all be asking ourselves, right? It's deep-seated control. I think that the way that the education system is, is deep-seated control. Mm -hmm. It's from day one, you're taught to do everything for government policy. I think that everything in in school from being in kindergarten on is to teach you how to be a good soldier for a foreign government, well, to me, for, for the US government, and to get involved in the, you know, the social security debt, the, the uh, get involved in working 100% to make sure that the government machine um, stays functioning properly. And keeps you away from the land, keeps you away from understanding how we are. Uh, it's disempowering. It's completely disempowering. And, and like, okay, so when I look at my children, let me look at it this way. When I look at my children, I, I learn so much from my kids. Um, I was talking to my son Remy, he's, he's five years old, and his understanding about what goes on in the world is amazing. Um, the kid's always naked, first of all, um, and he has no shame, and, I, and you just learn that they learn this kind of thing as they go to school. They learn shame, they learn you can't think that way. You have to do things a certain way. You do math. You have to calculate it all out exactly the way that they tell you. And if you don't do it right, you get an F, even though you get the question right. Right? So English is a very controlling language, right? It's full of nouns. Everything is, is like, definite. There's, like, that's a hawk. It doesn't matter doesn't matter how it flies, it doesn't matter what it's doing, it doesn't matter, you know, where it's coming from. You know, and you can't look at it as anything more than just a hawk. You can't, you can't look at a rock as anything more than just a rock. Water is just water, you know, and, and that's how you're taught, and that's how they want you to, to learn things in school, is, is so controlling and, and don't question anything. And, Man, it's such a hard question because I'm so against, it's, you know, it's a form of total and complete brainwashing to stay with and work for the governmental machine. I mean, that's the best way I can explain it. Thank you. 
Um, so I'd love to welcome Winona um, onto the stage into the fifth seat with us. So in a moment, um, each of you will have um, an opportunity to share roughly a few minutes for closing comments. So I'm going to mumble some words to buy you some time. Um, but what I wanted to share, um, well, first off, I wanted to thank all of you for participating in the conversation. A lot of the concepts that we've gone over today, they're not um, easy to digest, but it's the reality of the moment that we're in. Um, in my work, um, this moment, uh, this struggle, which feels really hard, um, is often referred to as the grown zone. It's kind of like a growth spurt. Um, and for those of you that grew, I did not. Um, you know that, that as you're growing, sometimes it can be painful. You physically feel pain as your bones are stretching and growing and expanding. And so, in our effort to grow and expand and evolve in this moment, it, may, it, it is already painful. And our ability to be present, to stay in the conversation, um, is important to making sure that we come forward with the right solutions that address the root causes of where we're at and where we, how we go forward. And so with that, I think I would love to start. We have a... a I can't see to the other end of the what, table. What, are you looking at me? Is that okay? <laughs> Which way are we going? Sorry, we were, we were totally having side conversations. Okay, we were. We're busted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a conversation we all want to be a part of. We just want to She was talking to me. It wasn't like I was going to ignore her. Also, threw also. Threw me under the bus, threw me under the bus. <laughs> also, it's not a side conversation because the mics are on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> You're funny. So I got one question, which, you know, in a, in a, I, I just feel like I just listen to these cool people all you talk back there. So I get to, can I say anything about what I heard you say that I thought was interesting? Or does that count as like my closing? I mean, can I have my cake and eat it too? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to take facilitation privileges again and say, do what you want when you Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> because I was like, oh, so aren't they interesting? Like one of those, one of those moments where I'm always talking about how I get to go everywhere. But I was like, I don't think I get out much. I never heard half that step put that way. So it's cool. So thanks, you know. So I, I, I just had, you know, because I was taking all these notes and I was thinking about it. And also my brother here, I really liked a lot of things he was saying. And and um, I just want to say, you know, I agree. So one thing about his language and mine, which are related, is I think it's funny because you keep talking about English. So we have uh, we have eight thousand verbs. I, I consider us like people of action, you know what I'm saying? You know, the English seems to be like a lot about naming stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I don't know, like, they, like it's how people think or whatever, you know? And I was like, we're just like, let's just do it, you know? And then we'll describe it and everything, so we gotta describe everything, but, you know, so that was one thing I was thinking about what he was saying like that, and then, um, and I think that part of, uh, well, I, you know, I think that, you know, one thing that sometimes I think is that, um, you know, people come here, and probably one of the biggest problems with that settler mentality is naming all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm really sick of all these mountains named after small white men. Like, I'm just, like, done. You know, I'm, like, done, you know, with that. I mean, like, it's nothing, you know, it's nothing, but it's like, what kind of arrogance names as something as immortal as a mountain after something as mortal as a human? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think like part of your job in the unsettling yourself or turning into people who like have a relationship with land is letting go of some of that. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of the names are really bad names, you know? I mean, I just have to be honest. There's a lot of guys who killed a lot of her people that they got mountains named after them. And I'm just like, you know, so I'm like, if you want to start fixing stuff, you got to do a little of that. And then I had this other idea when the brother was talking to is like, I feel like maybe we should have a language requirement. Like for residency, you should like know some of our language. What yeah, do you think of that? Come you know what I'm saying? It's like know the language of the, of the land that you're living on or something like that. I'm just saying like, you know, let's just talk about that. Cause you know, I think we need to, cause you gotta think things differently. Does that make sense? You know, so I was thinking about that a little bit, you know? And um, 
So then this, this guy is talking about that, you know, I just got to say, I don't know, that term governance, it kind of give me the creeps every time you say it, you know? So It's not the same thing as government. All right, so I guess, you know, it's super interesting listening to him, but in our language, a king, it doesn't, there's not an our land, it's the land to which the people belong. So it's like you belong to the land, you know? That's what I kept thinking about when he was, when he was talking about that, but, you know, and then I was thinking about the diaspora, and like how everybody came here and they didn't all ask to come here. You know, they end up here and they're here now and then. So I feel like that from my perspective, like, you know, remember I was talking about that covenant? Like, I feel like when you say you can take care of this land here, there's a covenant with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, she's talking about how some of her relatives, they came and live with our people. And I know we said here, take that land right there so you, for your family. We said that, but there was like a covenant that went with it. You know, if you come to a place, right? And I feel like that's one of our problems is there's just massive violation of the covenant, right? And so I feel like, you know, because we could all, we all need to be living on land, right? You know, because we're better people when we live with land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we got to feed ourselves. And so everybody needs some, you know, need to work with that. You know, that's what I was thinking about when she was saying this is like, you know, a little bit of that. And um, then uh, I, uh, you know, I, I wrote a bunch of other notes and it got kind of jumbled up, but you guys were super, super interesting. I just wanted to say and uh, see if there's anything else. Oh yeah, I do have like a little, but this could be in my closing remarks. I'll leave it at that and you can just stay tuned. I'll put that one in the closing remarks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So let's start with you. Would you like to kick us off with closing remarks? <clears throat> Yeah, I would like to, and you know, we talked about a lot of things that are that are really hard to swallow, and I'd like to leave us with with like some positive, you know. Um, let's just think about all the 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 things that we're going with, and start looking at it from a mind from like 1491, you know, and how how this land was before the craziness of ego and, and, you know, all this colonization happened. And then kind of like, how would, how would we be handling things in 1491? How would, how would we, you know, how would we take care of our children? How would we grow our food? How would we survive here for a hundred thousand years before the last 500 years? Um, how would we do it? And then, how can we integrate that into today and be positive and, and, you know, replenish the earth? You know, it's funny because I, I was talking to um, these tribes from the Amazon and I got a chance to, to hang out with them. And they came up because, you know, they're dying down there and, and they're fighting literally for their lives uh, against these extractive company, uh, industries, businesses, whatever. Um, and they, they had said that it's not climate change, it's that the mother is sick. Mother's sick and she's got a fever and she's gonna go through a cleansing. And whether we're gonna be part of that cleansing or not is up to us, you know? So I just say, let's work on decolonizing our minds and understand that we are connected to this land, we are part of this land, this is our mother and it's our family, and we have to love her the way that we love ourselves. And that's, that's what I want to leave you with, so. Thank you. I, I appreciate you naming that, because oftentimes I hear folks mm -hmm. say we're killing the earth, and we're not. We're killing our ability to live on the earth, but the earth is the most resilient thing that we know and will bounce back, whether we're on it or not. Um, I, I, I think it's, imp so I think it's important to leave y'all with some potential action steps. Um, and so the first is to um, step into a comfortable role following. Um, it's important for y'all to identify who are the people in your communities who are most marginalized um, and who have uh, most at stake because oftentimes they're the most visionary. 
um, and have been thinking through how they solve those problems um, and so can offer a lot of guidance to folks um, in shaping that. Um, the other thing is 45 is y'all fault, deal with it. Like, let's get it together. Um, 45 was elected. Um, I'm a Harry Potter fan. Y'all watch Harry Potter? Y'all read Harry Potter? <laughs> Don't tell this um, guy, though. Don't tell this guy. Right, not him. So, so uh, you know, they call, they call Lord Voldemort, he who shall not be named. 45 is similar. So I won't refer to him by name, just 45. Um, so, so there's a way in which y'all actually have to hold and burden a lot of the work to, to right this wrong. Um, and I think that there are some um, ways that y'all can be really creative in thinking through that, but I think at the root, like we need to be organizing rural white folks. Um, and I've organized white folks, it wasn't as successful as I think it could have been. Um, so I think y'all could do it better. Um, so I support that. And I do organizing trainings if y'all need some support on how to do that. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is trust black women. Always, always, always trust black women. Um, right, let's cop it up. It's not a joke. Let's clap it up. Let's clap it up for trusting black women. It's not a joke. Um, black women literally voted the most progressive down ballot consistently, um, right? So every other demographic of people had folks who voted for 45. I think like 3% of black women voted for 45. So when folks say um, it's because black folks didn't vote, that's actually not accurate. So black women literally birthed the world um, and we continue to mother every day, so trust us. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see my closing comments. So, um, closing. <laughs> uh, so um, I, there's a lot of talk about like land and place and um, and one thing that we think about is this idea that land plus language makes place, soil plus story makes place, um, and um, land plus language plus love makes home, soil plus story plus sacredness makes home, and the colonial mind uh, has a story, it uses that story to seize land and territory, it, but it, um, but it is, um, it is, it, it doesn't see a forest as uh, as a living, breathing part of itself. It sees timber waiting to be felled, and so it is forever lost. Um, and the the colonial mind is forever lost. And it is this notion of the sacredness of our relationships that is at this that has to be at the center of the way we reimagine the world. And it gets to the putting names on mountains. It gets to um, you know the school system. It's basically modeled after a prison, or a prison is modeled after school. I'm not sure which one, but they're both they're the only two institutions that fence in concrete and call it a yard. Um, and um, but so this idea of like the centrality of relationship and the sacredness of relationship means that we have to stop seeing ourselves as individuals. That that's just a lie. That we are just we are just nodes of complex relationships, and the relationship is what matters. Um, and that 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 we that we lean into that and love into that and live into that because that's that's the only way forward for. Uh, for us. Um, I just, uh, I just want to say a couple more things about my cool people here and thank them again. Uh, I learned a lot listening to all of you. And I was thinking about that Tony Mazaki thing you're talking about and I like the whole, you know, there's kind of this mythology I feel like that when we talk about just transition, it's like new. Yeah. And when he said that, I remember Tony Mazaki. And I remember that because there was uranium miners who were dying of lung cancer and he came out and stood with us, you know? And that was when the labor unions, you know, there was a strong time there. And I think about that, uh, you know, I really feel like the just transition is also a time to, to take back the labor movements, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do if we're gonna change things here, because we all gotta be here together to make this happen, you know? And so I, I really appreciated when he said that, because, you know, 
they they do, you know, in the in the how they tell the story, it makes it sound like we're talking about something weird and new, and we're not. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I had a couple other thoughts, and then, you know, I I heard what the sister said about the Virgin Islands. I add that in there now every time, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. You know, don't forget about people like, because that's, uh, America has really bad amnesia, mm -hmm. you know. I write for the Fargo Forum, which is super conservative, 23 newspapers in North and South Dakota and Northern Minnesota. And I wrote this article once called, Whatever Happened to Libya? Because you know what I'm talking about, it's like, for one moment, everybody knows about them and then we forgot. Mm -hmm. And they were still there actually, right? You know, so part of our responsibility, because we are people who are conscious, is to not do that. You know, because we need more conscious people and less people who are medicated by whatever they are medicated on. Right? Their sorrow or their opioids or their TV or their shopping. You know, whatever it is, they're self-medicating. Um, for here, you know, you... I, I listen to the brother a lot, you know, it's interesting, you know, because uh, it's always good to hear the people from their area talk. And uh, I started a land, a land trust on my reservation, 1,400 acres of land we bought back. And people gave it back to us. And uh, I did that because we needed to control our land. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you got to, sometimes you got to take the tools, you know, the paperwork, and you turn it to make it work for you, you know. But in that, I just want to say like one thing that has always hurt me here. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, I went to school out here. But I know one thing that really hurt me here is, uh, I think about eight years ago, I went to the Barry Library and Museum. I think it's called the Woods Library in Barry, Massachusetts. And I don't know if you've been there. I wrote about it. I wrote a chapter about it. But they have the largest collection of items taken from bodies at Wounded Knee of any place in the world. And it's in Barrie, Massachusetts. And I went there because I'd kind of heard about it. You know, it was one of those things in my travels I hear somebody say, we went this place. So I went and I interviewed the woman there. Her name was Audrey. She was a nice woman. But she told me that, she told me that the Indians had known something was going to happen, so they took their clothes off on the way to Wounded Knee, and they put them aside in, in the middle of the winter. That's what she told me. She didn't say that the guy who the museum is named after collected all those items, and that that collection, you know, was from someone who bought items that were stripped off of people who were dead, who had been shot. And I often wondered, you know, I often wondered about that story, and I always felt like that this town should, you know, should return those things. They should return those things to those people and those families. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to talk about really cool beadwork, they could commission an entire exhibit from Pine Ridge. Mm -hmm. You know, great beadwork that didn't involve, you know, little children's moccasins, you know, that shouldn't be there. And so, and then when this brother talks about a cultural center, I'm like, you know, that's what you need for these people here. They need a place that's, that's their safe space. You know, I know what it is like. I lived out here, I went to school here. They don't have much, I have a whole reservation, you know. So I don't know what to say where you start. You know, sometimes you have to, you know, fix things that are broken, you know, and not ignore them. And, and then at the same time, because when you, kind of fix that stuff, you get well. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody, we all know that. You know, Nelson Mandela spoke of, you know, those who oppressed and brutalized those people. It dehumanized them when they dehumanized those people. You know, and we know that. And we want to all be better people, right? And when we get to be better people, then we do things right. And you guys got this mostly up here, you know? I see you take good care of this land, you know? I see that, you know? I see that you try hard, you know? And, you know, keep that, you know, keep the covenant. Keep the covenant. But don't forget about these people, you know? 
So uh, that's what I want to say. And uh, like I did say, uh, keep an eye on us in Minnesota. We like to keep that oil from getting into this, this south of the border. We got a shot at it. Send your people out. Take care of those water protectors that are here. Honor them. Honor them. You know, funny side story. You know the Aveda, the cool people? You know what I'm talking about? Cool shampoo people? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I know they got bought by SD Lauder, but they're still cool. Anyway, so they have a one, in April they have a, you can, salons let your hair get cut and the proceeds go to Earth Month. Y'all follow me? And they give it away to grassroots groups protecting. So this last year it was Water Protector Month. That's what they called it. Isn't that cool? Yeah. But you know what the funny thing was is that no salon in the state of North Dakota would participate in something called Water Protector Month. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to say that's how it is where I live. You know, but what I want to say is kind of in closing is be a water protector. Everybody hold your head up and say, I'm a water protector. Right. Oh, I didn't mean it exactly like that, but, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, there you go. Miigwech. Yeah. There are some right there. Miigwech, thank you. I couldn't think of a better close than that. <laughs> Thank awesome you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.